Over two and a half million years ago, early members of the Homo genus began crafting the first tools. However, some researchers suggest that stone chipping might have initially been more of an instinctive behavior than a conscious innovation. In fact, instincts can take many forms. Certain ant species, for example, started practicing full-fledged agriculture tens of millions of years ago. Interestingly, it seems that their transition to farming was driven by unfavorable environmental conditions. Unlike insects, Homo sapiens relied, and still relies, on intelligence rather than instinct when developing tools. Since early humans lived in small tribes, each person had to be skilled in making tools, clothing, and shelters, as well as understanding hunting techniques, plants, animals, and natural phenomena. As a result, for a long time, natural selection favored increased brain capacity and enhanced cognitive abilities. However, the Neolithic Revolution and the shift to farming and animal husbandry radically changed human life. With the rise of permanent settlements and economic inequality, societies developed complex hierarchies. The growing exploitation of the majority by a wealthy minority led to the emergence of taxation systems and writing. The appearance of a wealthy, non-producing social class played a key role in the formation of the first cities. These cities, in turn, became centers of craftsmanship and trade. It's worth noting that from ancient times up until modern history, craftsmanship existed in two primary forms. The first was domestic craftsmanship, where peasant families produced items for their own use. Wool threads, fabrics, ceramic dishes, wooden spoons, plates, and other household goods. The second was specialized craftsmanship where artisans dedicated their lives to perfecting a particular craft, producing high-quality goods often purchased by the wealthier social classes. As civilizations advanced, societies and their products became increasingly complex, a process driven by labor specialization. However, in early modern Europe, this process took a dramatic turn with what we now call the Industrial Revolution. Around the transition from the late medieval period to the early modern era, society underwent significant transformations. Not only were feudal lords gradually pushed out of power, but many peasants also lost their land and moved to cities, becoming wage laborers. This led to the rise of manufactories, early factories where large numbers of workers produced goods through purely manual labor. But everything changed in the 18th century. In 1764, for example, the invention of the spinning jenny increased textile production efficiency nearly 20-fold. However, for workers, this meant that instead of employing 20 skilled spinners, factories could now hire a single operator to run the machine. In the early 19th century, economist Jean-Baptiste Say proposed a logical idea, later known as the compensation theory. It suggested that while automation leads to job losses in the short term, it ultimately creates new employment opportunities. A 20th century example is the computer. Its introduction eliminated professions like human calculators and reduced the number of clerks. But later, computers gave rise to entirely new professions, including programmers, graphic designers, and software testers. However, the compensation theory didn't always work perfectly. In the early 19th century, the rapid adoption of machinery left many workers unemployed, and telling them to just wait a few decades for new jobs to appear wasn't exactly reassuring when they needed food immediately. This frustration sparked the Luddite movement, the supposed leader, Ned Ludd, was likely a fictional character whose name was used in letters to factory owners, but the movement wasn't limited to letter writing. When the number of machines destroyed in England exceeded 1,000, the government responded with military force, deploying around 12,000 soldiers, a significant number, especially considering Britain was also at war with Napoleon at the time. Destruction of factory equipment was made a capital offense, and estimates suggest between 20 and 50 Luddites were executed, while many others were exiled to Australia. In the modern world, large corporations often benefit from higher unemployment rates, as job insecurity makes employees more obedient, hardworking, and less likely to demand better conditions. However, if you look at employment data from the past few decades, you'll notice that despite population growth and increasing automation, unemployment rates in most countries have remained relatively stable. Fully automated assembly lines, like those at Foxconn, are no longer science fiction, just like self-driving cars. But it's not like robots are actively stealing human jobs left and right. That said, simply trusting the compensation theory, the idea that technological progress will always create new jobs, might be a bit naive. Sure, new professions will emerge, 
but as machines improve, fewer humans will be needed. Industrial robots are still expensive and complex, so they won't be everywhere overnight. But neural networks? That's a whole different story. Without getting too technical, they're basically programs that mimic the way our brains process information. For a long time, their development was limited by weak computing power and a lack of large training datasets. But after 2010, things started to change. Unlike robots, neural networks are just software, meaning they can run on any computer. And while the technology still has flaws, even at this stage, AI can generate images, write texts, and answer a wide range of questions. It can even pass entrance or graduation exams at prestigious universities and write academic papers that meet the standards of major scientific journals. No, current neural networks aren't full-blown artificial intelligence. The human brain is still vastly superior. But as civilization advances, labor becomes more specialized. Many jobs no longer require full intellectual engagement. They just follow set algorithms, which means they can be automated. Right now, neural networks are just a tool. But if an artist, for example, starts using AI-generated images to speed up their work, their company might decide it needs fewer artists overall. On the other hand, a company could keep its staff and boost productivity instead. And while the global population keeps growing, most developed countries are actually shrinking, with average ages rising. In fact, most population growth today comes from Africa. But by the second half of this century, the world's population is expected to start declining. This means fewer working age people. I'm not ruling out the possibility of increased unemployment, but the economic system will likely respond by expanding unemployment benefits. These benefits in turn will help create a stable electorate that governments and corporations can rely on. But honestly, I don't think unemployment or some sci-fi robot uprising is the real danger of neural networks. The bigger issue, they're becoming a crutch for intellectual activity. Imagine dropping a group of Stone Age people onto an uninhabited island with no tools. They'd eventually recreate all the technologies of their time. Do the same in the Middle Ages, and you'd need hundreds or even thousands of settlers, peasants, craftsmen, monks who could write. Today, even millions of modern people couldn't recreate civilization. It sounds absurd, but humanity has reached a point where even if we were all moved to a new place, we couldn't recreate technology because so much is tied to digital tools databases, software, and other intangible instruments. Humans have become mere cogs in the system rather than carriers of knowledge, and an over-reliance on intellectual crutches is leading to cognitive decline. This isn't just about the shrinking size of the human brain over millennia. Norway's Center for Economic Research analyzed 730,000 IQ tests from different countries and found a concerning trend. Over the past four decades, each new generation's average IQ has dropped by about seven points compared to the previous one. In 2013, the journal Intelligence published a study suggesting that people in the 19th century were actually smarter than we are today. To be clear, this isn't about knowledge but about cognitive processing speed. However, it's worth noting that in 1984, American psychologist James Flynn revealed a different trend. Between the 1930s and 1970s, the average IQ in the United States rose by 14 points. But studies show that by the 1970s, the pattern reversed. People born in 1969 had an average IQ of around 102. Those born in 1989 scored 99. By the year 2000, the number had dropped to 90, and it's still falling. Sometimes when I read headlines online, I wonder if they were written by people from a dystopian future. Some experts even predict that in 150 years, the average intelligence level of an adult will be comparable to that of a modern nine-year-old. The main culprit? Our increasing reliance on intellectual crutches, calculators, computers, gadgets. Psychologist Ludmila Yashukova notes that the transition from the 20th to the 21st century brought a fundamental shift in the way teenagers process information. Logical structuring of information, based on conceptual thinking, has been replaced by a more superficial, image-based generalization. People can now retain huge amounts of information in their memory, but often don't grasp its essence. In other words, we're stuffing our brains with data, but losing the ability to think critically. A great example of this is in The Screen Idiot Factory, a book by neuropsychologist Michel Desmerget, where he explores the negative effects of gadgets on children's brains. And from what I understand, simply swapping entertainment for so-called useful information isn't enough for brain development. You actually have to process it, apply it in real life. But neural networks aren't just a crutch, they're a massive one. Instead of simplifying intellectual activity, they often replace it entirely. 
Even if they don't take over tons of jobs, they'll definitely become a go-to assistant for many. Our bodies are wired for efficiency. They constantly try to save energy by shutting down functions we don't use, especially if they're no longer crucial for survival. The irony is that we all crave comfort. We want to get more while doing less. In a way, laziness really is the engine of progress. But the more technological crutches we create, the weaker both our bodies and minds become. Ever since humans started using tools to make life easier, it's been a straight path toward a world where technology not only replaces us in everything but evolves without us. The real question is, what will become of us? Can we build a society focused not just on advancing technology, but on improving ourselves? Or will thousands of years of progress end in decline and the eventual extinction of our species, which chose the wrong path? One way or another, who you are today, your physical state, knowledge, skills, even your health, is largely shaped by your lifestyle. And yeah, sometimes it's tempting to blame circumstances, genetics, or plain bad luck. But for the most part, we shape ourselves. And the collective choices we make today ultimately define the future of humanity, 